Hello everybody, my name is David Crisp. Um, I'm autistic and I'm um, father of two grown up children with that are also autistic. And I've been an autism professional um, uh, working in health and social care for the last 14 years. And for the last 18 months, I've been a self-employed autism speaker and trainer. And today we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about uh, autism, particularly PDA and um, institutionalized parent care of blame. It's a subject very, very personal to me and some of the information I'll be presenting will be perhaps quite difficult to hear, but are from um, my personal experience. So I'll just try and bring the uh, PowerPoint up now. Just bear with me a second. The joys of technology. There we go. I'm hoping you can all see that. Okay, it's just loading. Okay, there we go. PDA and Individualized Parent Care of Blame, a personal and professional awareness campaign by David Crisp. And that's details on my website there, which I'll give you more information on at the end if there's time. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the following people. Kathleen Long, Dr. Judy Eaton, Professor Luke Clements, the PDA Society, Sunshine Support, Fight Back, that is spe correctly spelled, and there's two I's there, uh, Family Rights Group, and Action for ME, and finally, the Erlers Danlos Society. And Social Care Today, who have published several articles by myself, including one on this very topic. Right, content, so begin by talking about my story, and then, institutionalized parent care of blame, what it, what it is, uh, describing what fabricated and or old induced illness is, uh, points to consider, autism and PDA, the impact on parents and carers, advice to parents, moving forward, question and answers, and finally, where do we go from here? Coming up again. There we go. Okay, so my story, uh, subtitled, they don't do this in school. Due to their heightened anxieties and specific sensory needs, many autistic children behave differently in school than at home. This can have a profound and lasting effect upon the family when parents seek help or support for their children's needs. 2006 was our Annus Horribilis, in January of that year, a referral for help to the local authority requesting help to support our children who had been identified as having significant special needs led to our attendance at a child protection conference. This conference had been convened to consider the children due to parents seeking medical diagnosis, which was impacting on the children's needs. The social worker informed everyone present that the referral team had received a letter from Carers UK in respect of our children, which had mentioned a reference to possible autism. Without having met either of the children personally, she concluded that our parenting was impacting on their physical, emotional, social and educational development. However, everyone present ignored the Children and Family Service core assessment completed only 14 months previously by that same local authority, which had been very favorable to us as parents and in which no less than 18 professionals have been consulted. Indeed, this report, previously from November 2004, began by stating, despite fatigue, stress, and constant demands the children make in the home, these parents seem equal to the task. The social worker further goes on to report, parents can be commended in their persistence to seek explanation of a diagnosis in an effort to 100% respond to their children's needs, which other professionals might question. And finally, children feel safe to act out these behaviours at home, which could be considered unhealthy, considered healthy, sorry. In addition, he wrote, there has been a dichotomy of the daughter's social presentation within her family and elsewhere. Respecting this appears not always to be the case. This has caused parents to think professionals have questioned their abilities and motives. 
this assessment has not identified any concerns whatsoever. These children should receive all the appropriate resources and support to attend their children's needs. And yet, despite my referring to this very report and providing direct quotes as just presented, the Child Protection Conference ignored all of these findings and any factual written evidence which supported us as parents. I had been diagnosed as having chronic fatigue syndrome early in 2005 and had been unable to work in my role as administrative officer with the Department of Work and Pensions since April that year. This had culminated in my being retired from work on medical grounds from the civil service the week before the conference. Far from being supported by our physician, the professional had almost unilaterally decided that my physical and mental health problems had a significant negative impact upon my ability to cope with the problems that my children presented and that my wife and I were solely responsible for any challenging behaviour they presented. While still a baby, my daughter had been diagnosed as having a genetic condition called fetal anticonvulsant syndrome, which was known to be extrinsically linked to autism and challenging behaviour. Yet, here I was effectively being blamed for my health problems harming the children. It's almost unbelievable, unbelievable sorry, that a legitimate call for help for two children who had been assessed and reassessed by the Department of Work and Pensions as having significant disabilities with contributions from multiple health professionals should now be placed in this position. It appeared inconceivable to me that if everyone agreed that our children had disabilities, that we were good parents, and that a call for help could result in a child protection conference being held. My ill health had already cost me career, and now a group of professionals, the majority of whom had never met either of our children, would determine their fate. It was surreal, like the Magna Carta in reverse. Here we were, guilty of the court of professional opinion, and no amount of facts in our favour was admissible. A year after being commended by social services, because I had the misfortune to be unwell and wanted to seek the best for our children, my wife and I were being persecuted. By the end of that traumatic meeting, I resigned myself to the fact that all the cards were stacked against us and no amount of testimony or written factual evidence in our favour would be considered. Further, we had been informed that we would have no right of appeal of whatever was to be decided. As mentioned, most of the conference members had never met the children and yet had been happy to listen to opinion masquerading as fact and ignored fact-based evidence, which was truly a fait accompli. One by one, my wife and I had to hear platitudes about how loving and sincere we were as parents, whilst agreeing that they should be placed on the safe child protection register. The conference chair requested a psychological assessment of both parents as part of the plan going forward. Due to financial considerations and other factors, this was not carried out until several months later. The independent psychologist concluded no evidence of any psychological behaviour that impaired upon our ability to parent and criticised the conference for the position that they had placed the parents ourselves in. She felt that the children's challenging behaviour and lack of formal autism diagnosis was preventing us from accessing appropriate service provision and concluded there was not our stress which was impacting upon the children but rather the reverse, that our lack of appropriate support was responsible for our decline in health. However, despite this endorsement, our children remained on the Child Protection Register till the spring of the following year. Despite being under child protection, social worker visits became increasingly infrequent and no medical professional saw the children during that entire time. Towards the final months of this harrowing process, it was suggested by our children CAMS consultant that I may be autistic as you like your facts, Mr. Crisp. Consequently, I was referred for a diagnostic assessment. Unfortunately, the wait for this assessment further added to the delay in the children's names being removed from the Child Protection Register. My late diagnosis of autism in January 2007 at the tender age of 42 years should have provided more clarity to the professionals with regard to my children's disabilities, both genetically and statistically, my diagnosis and the children's presented behaviours should have increased the likelihood amongst the professionals that they may also be autistic. Unfortunately, the opposite was the case. Instead, it was argued by some of the professionals that 
professionals that the children's presenting behaviours were due to mirroring of my behaviour rather than being intrinsically wired in. In the spring of 2007, our children's names were unanimously finally removed from the register and we were given permission to pursue autistic assessments on our children, if we so wished. No apology was given for the immense stress that the previous long months had on our family or any indication that anyone had any responsibility, remorse or accountability for the trauma and devastation that had been inflicted upon us and our children or the immense strain that this whole process had placed on our marriage and family life. We were now free to pursue autism diagnosis, if we so desired, without prejudice. But no assessment of need, respite care or family support would be offered by social services for the remainder of the children's childhoods. We had been through hell and back simply for asking for help and now having been traumatized by the stigma of child protection had ourselves ripped open and laid bare we were now cast aside and back to no support in the family home within six months our son was diagnosed as being autistic too however it was to be another seven years before our daughter was diagnosed as autistic during the ensuing years she was diagnosed with non-verbal learning disability oppositional defiance disorder, autistic traits, obsessive compulsion disorder, joint hypermobility syndrome, sensory processing disorder, before finally being diagnosed as autistic at Lorna Wing Centre for Autism at the age of 15 and a half years of age by doctors Judith Gould and Sue Shepherd. During the latter stages of the CP registration, I requested a formal request under the Freedom of Information Act for access to our family's records. I discovered that very little new information had been received from health professionals from that previous core assessment way back in November 2004. The information had just been reinterpreted very differently based upon conjecture and opinion masquerading as facts. Unfortunately, the impact of being under child protection has remained today, nearly 15 years after our children's names were removed from the register. Freedom of Information Act requests and access to medical records have confirmed that emails continue to be sent from the conference chair many years later, every time that an NHS professional was inquired as to why our children have previously been under child protection. I was horrified to discover the following phrase, which has haunted me to this day. It read, parents' thoughts are bordering on fabricated and induced illness. This is the first time I had heard of this terminology. Little did I know then how prominent these accusations were and continue to be for parents of disabled children. It seems there was a concerted effort to diagnose anything other than autism for our daughter, as this would confirm what had been suspected by us and many professionals for over a decade. By the time of my daughter's diagnosis, I've been working with the National Autistic Society Adult Services for seven years, beginning as a support worker, before working my way up to team leader, person-centred planning facilitator, co-deliverer, fell training. I'd also begun to share my personal experience with staff. I explained how I, like many other parents, had to fight for a diagnosis for my children. Staff were horrified at how we'd fallen foul of the local authority simply for asking for help and support. At that time, we incorrectly thought that such incidents were isolated and that we had been personally singled out for seeking help. However, various reports and news items over the past decade have confirmed that this was not, and indeed is not, the case. Recent research studies have shown evidence that there is a culture of widespread institutionalised parent care or blame from many local authorities when parents of disabled children ask for help or support for their children. This is renewed interest in fighting for the rights of all parents of disabled children and campaigning to end this institutionalised blame culture. In recent years, a number of organisations have campaigned separately on this issue. And thankfully, changes in legislation and improved training of health and social work care workers have been proposed. But in the meantime, hundreds, perhaps thousands of parents of disabled children are still being affected by institutionalised parent care of blame and false accusations of fabricated 
and induced illnesses. This presentation is respectfully dedicated to all parents of disabled children who have suffered, continue to suffer, or will suffer in the future from a system which is culturally biased against them. So, what is Parent Carer Blame? A deliberate culture in which social care policies assume parental failings before accessing the needs of disabled children. That's from uh, Professor Clements and his colleague ALO in 2021. Current national guidance in England and Wales, which is working together, focused on safeguarding children from perceived parental abuse and neglect, whilst failing to address the support needs of disabled children where there is no evidence of neglect or abuse. There is currently no requirement that social workers assessing the needs of disabled children have any experience in assessing disabilities. Uh, the case for change or the McAllister review from last year, 2021, concluded that parents were subjected to a child protection investigation if they seek help, which in turn stops them from asking for the support they need. And many parents are falsely accused of fabricating or exaggerating their children's illness, illnesses or disabilities. So FII, fabricated or induced illness. Historically, this relates to a parent or caregiver exaggerating symptoms or inducing illness in a child for emotional or financial gain. This interpretation has widened, widened to include normal parental behaviour, such as anxiety when the child is ill, disabled or presenting challenging behaviours. And statistically, the prevalence of genuine FII is thought to be around 2.8 cases per 100,000 children. So therefore, with around 12 and a half million children under 16 in the UK, this relates to around between 50 and 351 true cases in the UK. However, a report from Action for ME in 2017 concluded that 22% of families had a safeguarding child protection referral made against them. The Airless Downless Society reported similar findings, and but 70% of or more of all cases would drop within a year. So points to consider. A parental excess of concern, desperation for support, for understanding and acceptance is not a great to abuse for children. That's from Kathleen Long and Dr. Judy Eaton's report from 2021. Exaggeration of risk from health and social care, including maladministration and falsified evidence. Non-specialists not acknowledging the opinions and diagnoses given by specialists if they are supportive of the parent's views or statements. For example, a number of times we've been told as parents, your children do not look autistic or, or um, we don't agree with the diagnosis, even though these are people themselves that are not involved in diagnosing autism, so wouldn't know um, what a child, an autism diagnosis is if they came across them anyway. The whole approach views disability as a problem which can be prevented or remedied by short family interventions with the family being the root cause of the problem. And finally, the situation worsens if parents complain against lack of service provision. We've all done that as parents. There's issues with school, maybe our child's being bullied, we complain to the school and rather than the school um, helping the situation, we just come across as bad parents or overprotective, anxious parents. The situation amongst autistic parents or parents of autistic children is particularly harrowing. Example, autism and PDA. The prevalence is that at least one in 100 people are diagnosed as being on the autistic spectrum. Around 125 and a half thousand autistic children in the UK. If 10% of those were false positives of FII, this would mean the families of 12 and a half thousand autistic children falsely considered um, FII cases. Paul et al in 2016 reported that one in five mothers of a child with autism had been investigated by social services. Similarly, Griffiths and others in 2019 identified that 19% of intellectually able autistic adults who are parents have professionals question their ability to parent, 
14% had been investigated by social services, 9% had been through child protection investigation, and 4% lost custody of their children. It is far more likely that a child that has a complex condition that is difficult to identify or, di identify or diagnose than a family is fabricating or inducing illness. Right. Autism and PDA. Many individuals remain undiagnosed. This is particularly true for females. Being autistic continues to carry a degree of stigma. Neurotypical parental approach is seen as preferable. Autistic mothers often mask or hide their difficulties in order to avoid judgment about their parenting. And if an autistic person behaves atypically, they are often judged negatively by professionals, including those working in social care. 43% of autistic children, students, sorry, autistic students persistently absent from school. And 70% of children with PDA aren't in school regularly, according to the survey by the PDA Society in 2019. PDA children may only respond to unconventional parenting techniques School refusal or non attendance is a red flag for FII. A number of cases that revealed autistic mothers as reporting anxiety, difficulty in communication, selective mutism, and conflict when interacting with social care professionals. Obviously, if you have issues being autistic uh, with social interaction, this is going to affect how you relate to professionals, particularly if they're critical of you and the risk of losing their child was reported as a significant concern. Many reported feeling scared and anxious because of the perceived power dynamic. This resulted in challenges for them in knowing how to approach professionals, how much information to give, what inventions, interventions to pursue. Autism I, in 2018, found that accusations of FII have increased sometimes as a result of autistic parents seeking further support or assessment for their children. It's reported that some professionals openly view parental autism as a risk factor because you're autistic, you're, your children are copying your behaviors and your impact on their development. However, seeking assessment of support, sometimes seeking multiple or repeating assessment for a child can take the form of an autistic special interest and pursuit of this can appear intense or obsessive. This sense of frustration on the part of parents can lead them either directly challenging the local authority or making formal complaints. The impact on parents and carers. The powers that local authorities have can present considerable and intolerable stress and harm amongst parents and families Parental health and well-being are neglected and children's needs are ignored at the cost of their well-being and future health. Devastating harm to families can include family breakdown, significant financial difficulties, the creation of fear or panic, the loss of trust in social services, frustration, exhaustion and the repeated experience of being blamed instead of supported by children's services. So... The impact on parents and carers, the panic of potentially, potentially having their children taken away course can, can become so intolerable that parents feel unable to fight appropriately for themselves or their children. This can have a devastating effect on personal life with no sleep or outside help. And parents may feel at breaking point with much fear of social services being judged and having to explain or justify everything they do. Parents become broken their children traumatised. There is a power imbalance, local authority holding all the cards, leading to a fear of the consequences should they wish to complain. This causes a circle of anxiety for um, parents of, of autistic or PDA children. First of all, they get the false allegation of fabricated induced illness from the social, children's social services. This leads to child protection proceedings with little and no existing support of families, resulting in trauma for the, fa for the whole family. And then, it, then after an extensive investigation, the case is closed, leaving no support for the family. 
emotional and financial damage, broken relationships with professionals, and then still no support. So it becomes a vicious circle of anxiety. So what can you do as a parent if you are accused of uh, FII, fabricated and induced illness, or simply exaggerating your child's autistic or PDA symptoms? First of all, if you fear being accused, read up about um, FII and be aware that having a diagnosis may not necessarily protect you. And secretly record all meetings. You have the right under the Human Rights Act to record all meetings. Never use medical terms, but never use terms. Don't go around saying your child's um, has for instance if your child has autism and epilepsy don't go around saying your child has tonic clonic seizures etc just say they have they have seizures you know you have to be very very careful in the language you use and understand if accused school will keep notes of all conversations if your child is being observed you may be considered as the cause of any behaviors sorry about the spelling mistake there eh? so when you are accused of um, FII only answer questions asked do not volunteer information it's very nice that we're we're willing to divulge information because we think it'll help our children sometimes too much information can actually be used as a weapon against us as parents and again like I mentioned before do not use medical terms if you do use medical terms like you use autism mention the doctor that that diagnosed the autism or the PDA and, and if you've got a date or approximate year, that, that, that'll help as well. So this doctor, like in our case, would be, well, whether you agree or not about our daughter being uh, saying she's autistic, we have a letter here dated uh, uh, July 2014, um, written by a doctor, um, Dr. Judy Gould from the Lorna Wing Centre, which confirmed she has, um, daughter has autism. Get advice before choosing a lawyer and always get one from outside your area. That way there is no conflict of interest because um, they may be working in some other capacity for one of the professionals involved. And always communicate to social worker whenever possible via email, because this leaves a paper trail. You can either print them off yourself or just keep them stored. Uh, your voice orders, he said, she said, and denials um, regards to telephone calls, etc. And identify for yourself a strong support network because you will need um, people to support you. And it's situations like these when you really find out who your, who your family and friends really, really are. So again, if social workers visit you, this one you must expect. Social workers turn up and announce you have a right to refuse access. But whenever possible, do show your child through the window so that they don't think you're hiding the child from you, which again is another red flag. Ask social services to phone in advance to make a mutually agreed visit or appointment. Arrange meeting so the friend or an advocate is present and only answer questions as before, do not volunteer information. Do not try and make friends with social workers, try and be professional. They are not there to be your friends. They shouldn't be there either to, tra to trap you or trick you out but it, try and keep the relationship professional. And make sure age appropriate toys are on for you. We all have this, my, my, my autistic um, daughter uh, was into watching programs, etc. on CBeebies way past the age of five. Not a good idea having underage videos or toys on view because social workers will not understand autism, autistic needs and may think that you are disabling your children in some way, which it, 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 although it may be complete rubbish, that's the sort of thinking that they may have to try and make sure the toys are like developmental age. And always be open to any suggestions. Be as cooperative with the, with the social worker, no matter what, what, they, what they say. Uh, at the end of the day, good, good or bad, they are there to do a job. And if you work with them, that will work in your favor. And again, know your rights know when to what to speak what when to when to speak when to say it and how to say it and and don't let them um bully you into uh, agreeing to things that uh, you might agree with 
So moving forward, it's not all negative. There is, there is new statutory guidance and training has been introduced to uh, improve the specific, to identify and uh, the specific needs of disabled children and their families. For example, uh, Kathleen Long, who I mentioned earlier, is a, an independent social worker, spent many years um, training social workers. She's uh, at the forefront of um, some new policy guidance for social workers uh, and the medical profession with regards to autism and how um, autistic children and their families are reviewed and assessed by um, professionals in health and social care. Excuse me a second. I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. All social care professionals are, are going to undertake training in FII, as I just mentioned by Kathy Long and the British Association of Social Workers. However, such training may take several months before it goes live, because obviously with the pandemic and etc., everything's been put on hold during these crazy pan post pandemic and pandemic times. In the meantime, where does that leave parents and carers? Uh, from Luke's, Luke, Professor Luke um, Clement's report published last year for the University of Leeds and Cerebra, there is a strong case for existing protocols to cease to apply to disabled children and their families, for which there is no cogent evidence of neglect or abuse. And social work assessments need to be through social care need, not an opportunity to judge parenting capacity. In other words, social work assessments should be ident looking at identifying social care, not an opportunity to judge how good or bad a parent is or their um, motiv motivations. So how do we respond? By campaign to cease in institutionalized targeting of parents of disabled children, uh, push for coordinated pressure from parent carer groups and disability charities, for local authorities to take immediate action now and to ensure that there is no watering down in any of these proposed changes. Pressure to be placed on local and national governments to fulfill their duties under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Pressure for an immediate end to targeting of particular disabilities such as ME, uh, my, myalgic encephalitis or chronic fatigue syndrome, Ehlers Danlos syndrome, autism and PDA. These are the groups of children, uh, affected children that are most likely um, for the parents to be accused of FII, as are any complex um, uh, unnamed disabilities as well. Awareness presentations to all parent and carer groups, national and local media and social media of institutionalized parent carer blame and false accusations of FII. Dr. Luke Clement's uh, report um, on institutionalized parent carer blame, which was published last year in July 2021, is easily easy to find through a Google search. Um, the whole report is nice and easy to read, very user friendly, and can be downloaded uh, and, and used to help parents understand uh, the situation that um, a lot of disabled parents find themselves in and what's um, the, the thinking behind certain actions and what can be done to improve our lot. Coordinated campaign through disability charities, uh, CICs, uh, parent carer groups of how parents and carers can best respond to false accusations of FII and parent carer blame. So on subject of campaigning for change, this is the campaign I set up myself last year. Unfortunately, many parents that are already in the system and feel pressured by, um, by social services are maybe reluctant to sign this for obvious reasons, thinking that again, this is another thing that could go back to haunt them. And the professionals too may feel, feel there's uh, issues with regard to signing this, but like as many people as possible to get this signed um, so that we can put pressure on the uh, Secretary of Health for, for Care to um, campaign to improve the lot of justice, improve the lot uh, for parents of disabled children. So there's the details there, https www.change.org 
forward slash justice for parents of disabled children. Uh, any further information on that, just email me directly. I'll give my email address at the very end. So this is the opportunity now uh, for you to answer your, uh, your question in terms about your experience and answer any questions. I appreciate that this is a recording, but um, I'll be quite willing to ask, ask any questions that you have via my um, via the chat or any emails that I'll provide later. So thank you for listening. That's my details there. David Crisp, autism speaker and trainer, yforautism.co.uk. Uh, email David Chris 431 at btinternet.com. Telephone 07572 833801. If you've enjoyed um, today, this presentation, uh, please review my business on Bing, Google, and freeindex.co.uk. And you can find me on Facebook and LinkedIn. Any questions, feel free to uh, mention them during this um, presentation event this afternoon or failing that, feel free to email me or message me on LinkedIn or Facebook at any time. Thank you very much. Thank you.